This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Invisible Girl by Mary Shelley This slender narrative has no pretensions of the regularity of a story, or of the development of situations and feelings. It is but a slight sketch, delivered nearly as it was narrated to me by one of the humblest of actors concerned. Nor will I spin out a circumstance interesting, principally from its singularity and truth, but narrate as concisely as I can how I was surprised on visiting what seemed a ruined tower, crowning a bleak promontory overhanging the sea that flows between Wales and Ireland, to find that through the exterior preserved all the savage rudeness that betokened many a war with the elements. The interior was fitted up somewhat in the guise of a summer-house, for it was too small to deserve any other name. It consisted but of the ground floor, which served as an entrance, and one room above which was reached by a staircase made out of the thickness of the wall. This chamber was floored and carpeted, decorated with elegant furniture, and, above all, to attract the attention and excite curiosity, there hung over the chimney-piece, for to preserve the apartment from damp a fireplace had been built evidently since it had assumed a guy so dissimilar to the object of its construction. A picture, simply painted in watercolours, which seemed more than any part of the adornments of the room, to be at war with the rudeness of the building the solitude in which it was placed and the desolation of the surrounding scenery. This drawing represented a lovely girl in the very pride and bloom of youth. Her dress was simple, in the fashion of the day. Remember, reader, I write at the beginning of the eighteenth century. Her countenance was embellished by the look of mingled innocence and intelligence, to which was added the imprint of serenity of soul and natural cheerfulness. She was reading one of those folio romances which have so long been the delight of the enthusiastic and young. Her mandolin was at her feet, her parakeet perched on a huge mirror near her. The arrangement of furniture and hangings gave token of a luxurious dwelling, and her attire also evidently that of home and privacy, yet bore with it an appearance of ease and girlish ornament, as if she wished to please. Beneath this picture was inscribed in golden letters, the Invisible Girl. Rambling about a country nearly uninhabited, having lost my way, and being overtaken by a shower, I had lighted on this dreary-looking tenement which seemed to rock in the blast, and to be hung up there as the very symbol of desolation. I was gazing wistfully, and cursing inwardly my stars which led me to a ruin that could afford no shelter, though the storm had began to pelt more seriously than before when I saw an old woman's head pop out from a kind of loophole, and as suddenly withdrawn. A minute after, a feminine voice called to me from within, and penetrating a little brambly maze that screened a door, which I had not observed before. So skillfully had the planter succeeded in concealing art with nature, I found the good dame standing on the threshold and inviting me to take refuge within. "'I had just come up from our cot hard by,' she said to look after the things, as I do every day. Will ye walk up till it is over? I was about to observe that the cot hard by, and the venture of a few raindrops, was better than a ruined tower, and to ask my kind hostess whether the things were pigeons or crows that she came to look after, when the matting of the floor and the carpeting of the staircase struck my eye. I was still more surprised when I saw the room above, and beyond all, the picture and its singular inscription, naming her invisible, whom the painter had coloured forth into very agreeable visibility, awakened my most lively curiosity. The rest of this, my exceeding politeness towards the old woman, and her own natural garrulity, was a kind of garbled narrative which my imagination eked out, and further inquiries rectified till it assumed the following form. Some years before, in the afternoon of a September day, which, though tolerably fair, gave many tokens of my temptuous evening, a gentleman arrived at a little coast town, about ten miles from this place. He expressed his desire to hire a boat to carry him to the town of about fifteen miles further on the coast. The menaces which the sky held forth made the fishermen loath to venture, till at length two, one the father of a numerous family, bribed by the bountiful reward the stranger promised, the other, the son of my hostess, induced by youthful daring, agreed to undertake the voyage. The wind was fair, and they hoped to make good way before nightfall. 
and to get into the port ere the rising of the storm. They pushed off with good cheer. At least the fishermen did. As for the stranger, the deep mourning which he wore was not half so black as the melancholy that wrapped his mind. He looked as if he had never smiled, as if some unutterable thought, dark as night and bitter as death, had built its nest within his bosom, and brooded therein eternally. He did not mention his name, but one of the villagers recognized him as Henry Vernon, the son of a baronet, who possessed a mansion about three miles distant from the town for which he was bound. This mansion was almost abandoned by the family, but Henry had, in a romantic fit, visited it about three years before, and Sir Peter had been down there during the previous spring for about a couple of months. The boat did not make so much way as was expected. The breeze failed them as they got out to sea, and they were fain with oar as well as sail, to try to weather the promontory that jutted out between them and the spot they desired to reach. They were yet far distant when the shifting wind began to exert its strength, and to blow with violent though unequal puffs. Night came on, pitchy dark, and the howling waves rose and broke with frightful violence, menacing to overwhelm the tiny bark that dared resist their fury. They were forced to lower every sail, and take to their oars. One man was obliged to bail out the water, and Vernon himself took an oar, and rowing with desperate energy equaled the force of the more practised boatmen. There had been much talk between the sailors before the tempest came on. Now, except a brief command, all were silent. One thought of his wife and children, and silently cursed the caprice of the stranger that endangered in its effects not only his life, but their welfare. The other feared less, for he was a daring lad, but he worked hard, and had no time for speech. While Vernon bitterly regretting the thoughtlessness which had made him cause the others to share a peril, unimportant as far as he himself was concerned, now tried to cheer them with a voice full of animation and courage, and now pulled yet more strongly at the oar he held. The only person who did not seem wholly intent on the work he was about was the man who bailed. Every now and then he gazed intently around, as if the sea held afar off, on its tumultuous waste, some object that he strained his eyes to discern. But all was blank, except as the crest of the high wave showed themselves, or far out on the verge of the horizon, a kind of lifting of the clouds betokened greater violence for the blast. At length he exclaimed, "'Yes, I see it, the larboard oar, now, if we can make yonder light, we are saved!' Both the rowers instinctively turned their heads, but cheerless darkness answered their gaze. "'You cannot see it,' cried their companion. "'But we are nearing it, and, please God, we shall outlive this night.' Soon he took the oar from Vernon's hand, who, quite exhausted, was failing in his strokes. He rose, and looked for the beacon which promised them safety. It glimmered with so faint a ray, that now he said, "'I see it,' and again, "'It is nothing.' Still, as they made their way, it dawned upon his sight, growing more steady and distinct as it beamed across the lurid waters which themselves became smoother, so that safety seemed to arise from the bosom of the ocean under the influence of that flickering gleam. "'What beacon is it that helps us at our need?' asked Vernon, as the men, now able to manage their oars with greater ease, found breath to answer his question. "'A fairy one, I believe,' replied the elder sailor. Yet no less is true. It burns in an old tumble-down tower, built on the top of a rock, which looks over the sea. We never saw it before this summer, and now, each night, it is to be seen, at least when it is looked for, for we cannot see it from our village, and it is such an out-of-the-way place that no one has need to go near it, except through a chance like this. Some say it is burnt by witches, some say by smugglers, but this I know, two parties have been to search, and found nothing but the bare walls of the tower. All is deserted by day, and dark by night, for no light was to be seen while we were there, though it burned sprightly enough when we were out at sea. "'I have heard say,' observed the younger sailor, "'it is burnt by a ghost of a maiden who lost her sweetheart in these parts, he being wrecked and his body found at the foot of the tower. She goes by the name among us of the invisible girl.' The voyagers had now reached the landing-place at the foot of the tower. Vernon cast a glance upward. The light was still burning. With some difficulty, struggling with the breakers, and blinded by the night, they contrived to get their little bark to shore, and to draw her up on the beach. 
They then scrambled up the precipitous pathway, overgrown by weeds and underwood, and, guided by the more experienced fishermen, they found the entrance to the tower. Door or gate there was none, and all was dark as the tomb, and silent as almost as cold as death. "'This will never do,' said Vernon. "'Surely our hostess will show her light, if not herself, and guide our darkling steps by some sign of life and comfort.' "'We will get to the upper chamber,' said the sailor, "'if we can hit upon the broken-down steps. "'But you will find no trace of the invisible girl, "'nor her light either, I warrant.' "'Truly a romantic adventure of the most disagreeable kind,' "'muttered Vernon, as he stumbled over the unequal ground. "'She of the beacon-light must be both ugly and old, "'or she would not be so peevish and inhospitable.' "'With considerable difficulty, and after diverse knocks and bruises, the adventurers at length succeeded in reaching the upper story, but all was blank and bare, and they were fain to stretch themselves on the hard floor, when weariness both of mind and body conduced to steep their senses in sleep. Long and sound were the slumbers of the mariners. Vernon but forgot himself for an hour, then, throwing off drowsiness and finding his rough couch uncongenial to repose, he got up and placed himself at the hole that served for a window, for glass there was none, and there being not even a rough bench, he leant his back against the embrasure as the only rest he could find. He had forgotten his danger, the mysterious beacon, and the invisible guardian. His thoughts were occupied on the horrors of his own fate, and the unspeakable wretchedness that sat like a nightmare on his heart." It would require a good-sized volume to relate the causes which had changed the once happy Vernon into the most woeful mourner that ever clung to the outer trappings of grief, as slight, though, cherished symbols of the wretchedness within. Henry was the only child of Sir Peter Vernon, and as much spoiled by his father's idolatry as the old baronet's violent and tyrannical temper would permit. A young orphan was educated in his father's house who in the same way was treated with generosity and kindness, and yet who lived in deep awe of Sir Peter's authority, who was a widower, and these two children were all he had to exert his power over, and to whom to extend his affection. Rosina was a cheerful-tempered girl, a little timid, and careful to avoid displeasing her protector, but so docile, so kind-hearted, and so affectionate, that she felt even less than Henry the discordant spirit of his parent. It is a tale often told. They were playmates and companions in childhood, and lovers in after-days. Rosina was frightened to imagine that the secret affection and the vows they pledged might be disapproved of by Sir Peter. But sometimes she consoled herself by thinking that perhaps she was in reality her Henry's destined bride, brought up with him under the design of their future union and Henry, while he felt that this was not the case, resolved to wait only until he was of age to declare and accomplish his wishes in making the sweet Rosina his wife. Meanwhile, he was careful to avoid premature discovery of his intentions, so to secure his beloved girl from persecution and insult. The old gentleman was very conveniently blind. He lived always in the country, and the lovers spent their lives together unrebuked and uncontrolled. It was enough that Rosina played on her mandolin and sang Sir Peter to sleep every day after dinner. She was the sole female in the house, above the rank of a servant, and had her own way in the disposal of her time. Even when Sir Peter frowned, her innocent caresses and sweet voice were powerful to smooth the rough current of his temper. If ever human spirit lived in an earthly paradise, Rosina did at this time. Her pure love was made happy by Peter's constant presence and the confidence they felt in each other, and the security with which they looked forward to the future, rendered their path one of roses under a cloudless sky. Sir Peter was the slight drawback that only rendered their tete-a-tete -tete more delightful, and gave value to the sympathy they each bestowed on the other. All at once an ominous personage made its appearance in Vernon Place, in the shape of a widow-sister of Sir Peter, who, having succeeded in killing her husband and children with the effects of her vile temper, came, like a harpy, greedy for new prey, under her brother's roof. She, too, soon detected the attachment of the unsuspicious pair. She made all speed to impart her discovery to her brother, and at once to restrain and inflame his rage. Through her contrivance Henry was suddenly dispatched on his travels abroad, that the coast might be clear for the persecution of Rosina 
and then the richest of the lovely girl's many admirers whom, under Sir Peter's single reign, she was allowed, nay, almost commanded to dismiss, so desirous was he of keeping her for his own comfort, was selected, and she was ordered to marry him. The scenes of violence to which she was now exposed, the bitter taunts of the odious Mrs. Bainbridge, and the reckless fury of Sir Peter, was the more frightful and overwhelming from their novelty. To all she could only oppose a silent, tearful, but immutable steadiness of purpose. No threats, no rage, could extort from her more than a touching prayer that they would not hate her, because she could not obey. "'There must be something we don't see under all this,' said Mrs. Bainbridge. "'Take my word for it, brother. She corresponds secretly with Henry. Let us take her down to your seat in Wales, where she will have no pensioned beggars to assist her.' and we shall see if her spirit be not bent to our purpose. Sir Peter consented, and they all three posted down to Blankshire, and took up their abode in the solitary and dreary-looking house, before alluded to as belonging to the family. Here poor Rosina's sufferings grew intolerable. Before, surrounded by well-known scenes, and in perpetual intercourse with kind and familiar faces, she had not despaired in the end of conquering by her patience the cruelty of her persecutors, nor had she written to Henry, for his name had not been mentioned by his relatives, nor their attachment alluded to, and she felt an instinctive wish to escape the dangers about her without his being annoyed, or the sacred secret of her love being laid bare, and wronged by the vulgar abuse of his aunt, or the bitter curses of his father." But when she was taken to Wales and made prisoner in her apartment, when the flinty mountains about her seemed feebly to imitate the stony hearts she had to deal with, her courage began to fail. The only attendant permitted to approach her was Mrs. Bainbridge's maid, and under the tutelage of her fiend-like mistress, this woman was used as a decoy to entice the poor prisoner into confidence, and then to be betrayed. The simple, kind-hearted Rosina was a facile dupe, and at last in the excess of her despair wrote to henry and gave the letter to this woman to be forwarded the letter in itself would have softened marble it did not speak of their mutual vows but it asked him to intercede with his father that he would restore her the kind place she had formerly held in his affections and cease from a cruelty that would destroy her for i might die wrote the helpless girl but marry another never that single word, indeed, had sufficed to betray her secret, had it not been already discovered. As it was, it gave increased fury to Sir Peter, as his sister triumphantly pointed it out to him, for it need hardly be said that while the ink of the address was yet wet, and the seal still warm, Rosina's letter was carried to this lady. The culprit was summoned before them. What ensued none could tell. For their own sakes the cruel pair tried to palliate their part. Voices were high, and the soft murmur of Rosina's tone was lost in the howling of Sir Peter and the snarling of his sister. "'Out of doors you shall go!' roared the old man. "'Under my roof you shall not spend another night!' And the words, "'Infamous seductress!' and worse, such as had never met the poor girl's ear before, were caught by listening servants, and to each angry speech of the baronet. Mrs. Bainbridge added an envenomed point worse than all. More dead than alive, Rosina was at last dismissed. Whether guided by despair, whether she took Sir Peter's threats literally, or whether his sister's orders were more decisive, none knew. But Rosina left the house. A servant saw her cross the park, weeping and wringing her hands as she went. What became of her none could tell. Her disappearance was not disclosed to Sir Peter till the following day. And then he showed by his anxiety to trace her steps and to find her that his words had been but idle threats. The truth was that though Sir Peter went to frightful lengths to prevent the marriage of the heir of his house with the portionless orphan, the object of his charity, yet in his heart he loved Rosina, and half his violence to her rose from anger at himself for threatening her so ill. Now remorse began to sting him, as messenger after messenger came back, without tidings of his victim. He dared not confess his worst fears to himself and when his inhuman sister tried to harden his conscience by angry words, cried, The vile hussy has too surely made away with herself out of revenge to us. An oath, the most tremendous, and a look sufficient to make even her tremble, commanded her silence. 
Her conjecture, however, appeared too true. A dark and rushing stream that flowed at the extremity of the park had doubtless received the lovely form, and quenched the life of this unfortunate girl. Sir Peter, when his endeavours to find her proved fruitless, returned to town, haunted by the image of his victim, and forced to acknowledge in his own heart that he would willingly lay down his life could he see her again, even though it were as the bride of his son, his son before whose questioning he quailed like the veriest coward. For when Henry was told of the death of Rosina, he suddenly returned from abroad to ask the cause, to visit her grave and mourn her loss in the groves and valleys which had been the scenes of their mutual happiness. He made a thousand inquiries, and an ominous silence alone replied. Growing more earnest and more anxious, at length he drew from servants and dependents, and his odious aunt herself, the whole dreadful truth. From that moment despair struck his heart, and misery named him her own. He fled from his father's presence, and the recollection that one whom he ought to revere was guilty of so dark a crime haunted him as of the old Eumenides tormented the souls of men given up to their torturings. His first, his only wish was to visit Wales, and to learn if any new discovery had been made, and whether it were possible to recover the mortal remains of the lost Rosina. So, to satisfy the unquiet longings of his miserable heart, on this expedition he was bound when he made his appearance at the village before named. And now, in the deserted tower, his thoughts were busy with the images of despair and death, and what his beloved one had suffered before her gentle nature had been goaded to such a deed of woe. While immersed in gloomy reverie, to which the monotonous roaring of the sea made fit accompaniment, hours flew on, and Vernon was at last aware that the light of morning was creeping from out its eastern retreat and dawning over the wild ocean, which still broke in furious tumult on the rocky beach. His companions now roused themselves and prepared to depart. The food they had brought with them was damaged by sea-water, and their hunger, after hard labour and many hours' fasting, had become ravenous. It was impossible to put to sea in their shattered boat, but there stood a fisher's cot about two miles off in a recess in the bay, of which the promontory on which the tower stood formed one side and to this they hastened to repair. They did not spend a second thought on the light which had saved them, nor its cause, but left the ruin in search of a more hospitable asylum. Vernon cast his eyes around as he quitted it, but no vestige of inhabitant met his eye, and he began to persuade himself that the beacon had been a creation of fancy merely. Arriving at the cottage, in question, which was inhabited by a fisherman and his family, they made a homely breakfast, and then prepared to return to the tower, to refit their boat, and, if possible, bring her round. Vernon accompanied them, together with their host and his son. Several questions were asked concerning the invisible girl and her light, each agreeing that the apparition was novel, and not one being able to give an explanation of how the name had become affixed to the unknown cause of this singular appearance though both of the men of the cottage affirmed that once or twice they had seen a female figure in the adjacent wood, and that now and then a stranger girl made her appearance at another cot a mile off, on the other side of the promontory, and bought bread. They suspected both these to be the same, but could not tell. The inhabitants of the cot, indeed, appeared too stupid even to feel curiosity, and had never made any attempt at discovery. The whole day was spent by the sailors in repairing the boat, and the sound of hammers and the voices of the men at work resounded along the coast, mingled with the dashing of the waves. This was no time to explore the ruin, for one who, whether human or supernaturally, so evidently withdrew herself from intercourse with every living being. Vernon, however, went over the tower, and searched every nook in vain. The dingy bare walls bore no token of serving as a shelter, and even a little recess in the wall of the staircase, which he had not observed before, was equally empty and desolate. Quitting the tower, he wandered in the pine wood that surrounded it, and giving up all thought of solving the mystery, was soon engrossed by thoughts that touched his heart more nearly, when suddenly there appeared on the ground at the feet the vision of a slipper, since Cinderella so tiny a slipper had never been seen. As plain as she could speak, it told a tale of elegance, loveliness, and youth. Vernon picked it up, he had often admired Rosina's singularly small foot, and his first thought was a question whether this slipper would have fitted it. It was very strange. 
It must have belonged to the invisible girl. Then there was a fairy form that kindled that light, a form of such material substance that its foot needed to be shod, and yet how shod, with kids so fine and of shape so exquisite that it exactly resembled such as Rosina wore. Again the recurrence of the image of the beloved dead came forcibly across him, and a thousand home-felt associations, childish yet sweet, and lover-like, though trifling, so filled Vernon's heart that he threw himself his length on the ground and wept more bitterly than ever the miserable fate of the sweet orphan. In the evening the men quitted their work, and Vernon returned to them to the cot where they were to sleep, intending to pursue their voyage, weather permitting, the following morning. Vernon said nothing of his slipper, but returned with his rough associates. Often he looked back, but the tower rose darkly over the dim waves, and no light appeared. Preparations had been made in the cot for their accommodation, and the only bed in it was offered Vernon, but he refused to deprive his hostess, and spreading his cloak on a heap of dry leaves, endeavoured to give himself up to repose. He slept for some hours, and when he awoke, all was still, save that the hard breathing of the sleepers in the same room with him interrupted the silence. He rose, and going to the window, looked out over the now placid sea towards the mystic tower, the light burning there, sending its slender rays across the wave. Congratulating himself on a circumstance that he had not anticipated, Vernon softly left the cottage, and wrapping his cloak around him, walked with a swift pace around the bay towards the tower. He reached it. Still the light was burning. To enter and restore the maiden her shoe would be but an act of courtesy, and Vernon intended to do this with such caution as to come unaware before its wearer could, with her accustomed arts, withdraw herself from his eyes. But unluckily, while yet making his way up the narrow pathway, his foot dislodged a loose fragment that fell with a crash and sound down the precipice. He sprung forward on this to retrieve by speed the advantage he had lost by this unlucky accident. He reached the door. He entered. All was silent. But also all was dark. He paused in the room below. He felt sure that a slight sound met his ear. He ascended the steps, and entered the upper chamber, but blank obscurity met his penetrating gaze. The starless night admitted not even a twilight glimmer through the only aperture. He closed his eyes to try, on opening again, to be able to catch some faint, wandering ray on the visual nerve but it was in vain. He groped round the room, he stood still, and held his breath, and then, listening intently, he felt sure that another occupied the chamber with him, and that its atmosphere was slightly agitated by another's respiration. He remembered the recess in the staircase, but before he approached it he spoke. He hesitated a moment what to say. "'I must believe,' he said, "'that misfortune alone can cause your seclusion, and if the assistance of a man, of a gentleman, an exclamation interrupted him. A voice from the grave spoke his name. The accents of Rosina syllabled, "'Henry! Is it indeed Henry whom I hear?' He rushed forward, directed by the sound, and clasped in his arms the living form of his own lamented girl. His own invisible girl, he called her, for even yet, as he felt her heart beat near his, and as he entwined her waist with his arm, supporting her as she almost sank to the ground with agitation, he could not see her and, as her sobs prevented her speech, no sense but the instinctive one that filled his heart with tumultuous gladness told him that the slender, wasted form he pressed so fondly was the living shadow of the Hebe beauty he had adored. The morning saw this pair thus strangely restored to each other on the tranquil sea, sailing with a fair wind for L, whence they were to proceed to St. Peter's seat, which three months before Rosina had quitted in such agony and terror. The morning light dispelled the shadows that had veiled her, and disclosed the fair person of the invisible girl. Altered indeed she was, by suffering and woe, but still the same sweet smile played on her lips, and the tender light of her soft blue eyes were all her own. Vernon drew out the slipper, and shoved the cause that had occasioned him to resolve to discover the guardian of the mystic beacon. Even now he dared not inquire how she had existed in that desolate spot, or wherefore she had so sedulously avoided observation, when the right thing to have been done was to have sought him immediately, under whose care, protected by whose love, no danger need be feared. But Rosina shrunk from him as he spoke, 
and a death-like pallor came over her cheeks as she faintly whispered, "'Your father's curse, your father's dreadful threats!' It appeared, indeed, that Sir Peter's violence and the cruelty of Miss Bainbridge had succeeded in impressing Rosina with wild and unvanquishable terror. She had fled from their house without plan or forethought. Driven by frantic horror and overwhelming fear, she had left it with scarcely any money, and there seemed to be no possibility of either returning or proceeding onward. She had no friend except Henry in the wide world. Whither will she go? To have sought Henry would have sealed their fates to misery, for, with an oath, Sir Peter had declared he would rather see them both in their coffins than married. After wandering about, hiding by day, and only venturing forth at night, she had come to this deserted tower, which seemed a place of refuge. I lo, she had lived since then, she could hardly tell. She had lingered in the woods by day, or slept in the vault of the tower, an asylum where none were acquainted with or had discovered. By night she burned the pine cones of the woods, and night was her dearest time, for it seemed to her as if security came with darkness. She was unaware that Sir Peter had left that part of the country, and was terrified lest her hiding-place should be revealed to him. Her only hope was that Henry would return, that Henry would never rest till he had found her. She confessed that the long interval of the approach of winter had visited her with dismay. She feared that as her strength was failing, and her form wasting to a skeleton, that she might die and never see her own Henry more. An illness, indeed, in spite of all his care, followed her restoration to security and the comforts of civilized life. Many months went by before the bloom revisiting her cheeks, and her limbs regaining their roundness. She resembled once more the picture drawn of her in her days of bliss, before any visitation of sorrow. It was a copy of this portrait that decorated the tower, the scene of her suffering, in which I had found shelter. Sir Peter, overjoyed to be relieved from the pangs of remorse, and delighted again to see his orphan ward, whom he really loved, was now as eager as before he had been adverse to bless her union with his son. Miss Bainbridge they never saw again. But each year they spent a few months in their Welsh mansion, the scene of their early wedded happiness, and the spot where again poor Rosina had awoke to life and joy after her cruel persecutions. Henry's fond care had fitted up the tower and decorated it as I saw, and often did he come over with his invisible girl to renew, in that very scene of its occurrence, the remembrance of all the incidents which had led to their meeting again, during the shades of night in that sequestered ruin. End of the Invisible This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Invisible Girl by Mary Shelley This slender narrative has no pretensions of the regularity of a story, or of the development of situations and feelings. It is but a slight sketch, delivered nearly as it was narrated to me by one of the humblest of actors concerned. Nor will I spin out a circumstance interesting, principally from its singularity and truth, but narrate as concisely as I can how I was surprised on visiting what seemed a ruined tower, crowning a bleak promontory overhanging the sea, that flows between Wales and Ireland, to find that through the exterior preserved all the savage rudeness that betokened many a war with the elements. The interior was fitted up somewhat in the guise of a of loophole, and as suddenly withdrawn. A minute after, a feminine voice called to me from within, and penetrating a little brambly maze that screened a door, which I had not observed before. So skillfully had the planter succeeded in concealing art with nature, I found the good dame standing on the threshold and inviting me to take refuge within. I had just come up from our cot hard by, she said, to look after the things as I do every day. Will you walk up till it is over? I was about to observe that the cot hard by, and the venture of a few raindrops, was better than a ruined tower, and to ask my kind hostess whether the things were pigeons or crows that she came to look after, when the matting of the floor and the carpeting of the staircase struck my eye. I was still more surprised when I saw the room above, and beyond all, the picture and its singular inscription, naming her invisible, whom the painter had coloured forth into very agreeable visibility awakened my most lively curiosity. 
the rest of this my extra summer house, for it was too small to deserve any other name. It consisted but of the ground floor, which served as an entrance, and one room above, which was reached by a staircase made out of the thickness of the wall. This chamber was floored and carpeted, decorated with elegant furniture, and, above all, to attract the attention and excite curiosity, there hung over the chimney-piece, for to preserve the apartment from damp a fireplace had been built evidently since it had assumed a guise so dissimilar to the object of its construction. A picture, simply painted in watercolours, which seemed more than any part of the adornments of the room, to be at war with the rudeness of the building, the solitude in which it was placed, and the desolation of the surrounding scenery. This drawing represented a lovely girl in the very pride and bloom of youth. Her dress was simple, in the fashion of the day. Remember, reader, I write at the beginning of the eighteenth century. Her countenance was embellished by the look of mingled innocence and intelligence, to which was added the imprint of serenity of soul and natural cheerfulness. She was reading one of those folio romances which have so long been the delight of the enthusiastic and young. Her mandolin was at her feet, her parakeet perched on a huge mirror near her. The arrangement of furniture and hangings gave token of a luxurious dwelling, and her attire also evidently that of home and privacy, yet bore with it an appearance of ease and girlish ornament, as if she wished to please. Beneath this picture was inscribed in golden letters, THE INVISIBLE GIRL. Rambling about a country nearly uninhabited, having lost my way, and being overtaken by a shower, I had lighted on this dreary-looking tenement which seemed to rock in the blast, and to be hung up there as the very symbol of desolation. I was gazing wistfully, and cursing inwardly my stars which led me to a ruin that could afford no shelter, though the storm had began to pelt more seriously than before, when I saw an old woman's head pop out from a kind of politeness towards the old woman, and her own natural garrulity was a kind of garbled narrative which my imagination eked out and further inquiries rectified till it assumed the following form. Some years before, in the afternoon of a September day, which, though tolerably fair, gave many tokens of my temptuous evening, a gentleman arrived at a little coast town, about ten miles from this place. He expressed his desire to hire a boat to carry him to the town of about fifteen miles further on the coast. The menaces which the sky held forth made the fishermen loath to venture, till at length two, one the father of a numerous family, bribed by the bountiful reward the stranger promised, the other the son of my hostess, induced by youthful daring, agreed to undertake the voyage. The wind was fair, and they hoped to make good way before nightfall, and to get into the port ere the rising of the storm. They pushed off with good cheer, at least the fishermen did. As for the stranger, 